Fordlandia. The name is so redolent with myth that I can do no better to repeat it as the title of my next story. Fordlandia, the great entrepreneur Henry Ford's rubber plantation in the Amazon jungle and the site of a dream of modern progress. Fordlandia, straight lines of whitewashed houses, gleaming machinery, and the marching rows of clean weeded rubber trees leading toward efficiency, wealth, and power. Then, a few years later, Fordlandia, rusting ruins, encroaching mud, an abandoned water tower, and Stoller's imperial debris. Fordlandia was an eruption of man in Brazil in the late 1920s and 1930s. Even more than Danish pigs, Fordlandia takes us into the tangles and muddles of man as he stalks the earth. Fordlandia is man in his most general form, the machine of replication, and also at his most strange and particular, entwined and emerging from the petty contingencies of history. Then too, there's the hidden force, the force of proliferation and also its limit. I follow Barry Machado's nicely tangled version of this history. Through much in the 1920s, he explained, a network of imperialism and intrigue made good use of Ford, the era's great entrepreneur. Henry Hoover, then US Secretary of Commerce, had spread the word that Americans must have their own rubber, a strategic resource that should be free from other imperial interests. The first, effect, first efforts to follow this up looked to the Philippines, then a US colony, but Filipino nationalists blocked them. In this climate, Brazilian would-be comprador capitalists emerged, and they courted Ford, who had not previously been interested in rubber. In 1927, a secret cabal involving a Brazilian businessman, an American counselor secretary, the Pará governor, a British facilitator, and a local mayor succeeded in making Ford an offer he could not refuse. Ford signed and hired staff to open his plantation. But Brazilian politics was a hotbed of oppositional factions, and another group tipped local journalists about the machinations behind Ford's deal. In 1928, the journalists spread the story of the cabal. Ford was shocked, according to Machado. He had never visited Brazil and had not been paying attention to the politics. But now the plantation was already coming into being. Ford fired his staff, American and Brazilian, Instead, he hired an honest man he could trust, a Norwegian-American ship captain. The fact that the captain knew nothing about Brazil or rubber was a recommendation. <laughs> Meanwhile, the governor of Pará changed and the new officials were hostile to Ford. Ford responded by closing the plantation to the world. It was see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Without local dialogue, the captain and his successors managed the plantation in an almost parodied version of white modern order, an eruption of man in both his most squeaky clean general and his most entangled in contingency form. From the first, it was a disaster. Plantation managers tried to make a modern place for labor with wages instead of trade goods and with expectations of abstention from wine and women. The Brazilian workers, both caboclo and indigenous, found these conditions incomprehensible and refused to follow them. There were riots. But the crowning disasters came from the non-humans. As a machine of replication, the plantation sped up the growth not just of rubber trees, but also of their adversaries. To appreciate how plant pathologies became the hidden force, I need to tell you a little about the fungus that caused river, causes rubber leaf blight Microcyclus uli. This fungus spreads slowly and causes little harm when rubber is surrounded by other trees, as in the Amazon forest. But take a plantation in which all the other trees have been removed and rubber trees have, trees have been planted, cheek and jowl, a machine of replication. A new mode of fungal proliferation kicks in, already an attribute of the fungus, but energized by the plantation. There, quickly produced asexual spores merely have to pass from one leaf to a similar touching leaf to infect a new tree. Meanwhile, the plantation is structured to speed up and synchronize the flush of young leaves. The fungus, which infects only young leaves, flourishes in this new regime of growth. The architecture of the plantation promotes not just the growth of rubber, but also the prol proliferation of rubber leaf blight. In Fordlandia, rubber leaf blight exploded, and all the trees died. 
Rubber leaf blight was already well known in the 1920s. If Fordlandia had not shielded itself from outside influences, both local and foreign, perhaps things would have been arranged differently. Indeed, eventually, some operations were moved to a drier site, Belterra, where workers assiduously top grafted, inspected, and washed the trees to deter insects and fungi. Still, almost no rubber was produced throughout the experiment. To this day, no one produces rubber in plantation in Brazil. Rubber plantations are limited to Asia and Africa, where Brazilian seeds were transported without accompanying fungi. It's telling that the United Nations has placed rubber leaf blight on its list of biological weapons. It would not take a terrorist plot to spread the fungus, destroying plantation economies. The fact that this spread has not happened so far is testimony to the gaps between plantations, the patchy Anthropocene. Fordlandia was an eruption of man, more clearly visible because of its failure. Most accounts focus on Henry Ford as tragic hero. Fordlandia appears as a homunculus from Henry Ford's brain. I picked Machado because his version evades this trap, which covers up the eruption of man. If heroism is blocking our view, it's time to turn to that story. Heroism is botulism, 